Hi, Bill Box here. Welcome to our program today. We are going to bring into your home some of the best jazz available in the world. And we have some terrific people who are going to play it for you today. As we salute and welcome back to New York, the incredible Newport Jazz Festival in its 26 years. Now to New York to work on a television show. I used to come to New York uh, for various cultural reasons, and one of the reasons was Bobby Short. Frequently, I first met Bobby Short even before I got into television. I've been a fan of his. Uh, we know him as a tremendous song stylist, and I think we overlook the fact. I said this once before in the program that you are a terrific jazz pianist. Oh, with sidemen like I just had, I can't miss. <laughs> can't miss. <laughs> what are you doing in the jazz festival? I'm producing and performing, which is a new kind of role for me. I imagine you'd be a very good producer. Well, I hope so. Oh. My co-producer is Robert Kimball, who is a very erudite in matters musical, that is, and uh, we're going to be producing an evening called Black Broadway. Black Broadway, based on... It's all about participation of blacks on the Broadway stage from the first part of the century to 1945. So you'll be drawing from what kind of composers? Oh, from the earliest, like, uh, lyricists like Paul Ernst Dunbar, the 19th century poet, and uh, J. Rosamond Johnson and Bob Coles, who wrote operettas back mm -hmm. in those days. Of course, U.B. Blake, and uh, we're going to sidestep step, uh, uh, Trimonisha, because that's been done and done and done. But we're, we're going to include uh, composers just like Harold Arthur, who wrote things for the Cotton Club parades of yesteryear, and Vernon Duke and uh, Duke Ellington, of course. The Cotton Club, Club parades were performed where? On Broadway? Or they were performed at the Cotton Club. We're cheating mm -hmm. a tiny bit because we felt that a lot of good music was composed for those shows, mm -hmm. and great performers performed the music. Now, I want you to do something from your program, but first, let's get, let's get it memorized. Where is it going to be and when? It's Avery Fisher Hall, 8 o'clock p.m., June 24th. That's a Sunday. Sunday night, mm -hmm. Avery Fisher Hall. Yeah. Uh, you want to do something by Harold Arlen? Yes. From which This production? is from a Cotton Club parade of the early 1930s, I believe, Bill, and it was sung by Avon Long and Lena Horn. Oh, wow. All it's, right, let's uh, hear it. <laughs> Sunday night, the 24th, Avery Fisher Hall, 8 o'clock. Now, one of the things I want to do on today's show is talk a little bit about style. How could I analyze the Bobby Short style of playing? Not singing. That's unique, totally unto you. But who are the people who influenced you as a musician? Well, Duke Ellington and uh, Cy Walter and Fats Waller and uh, uh, who else? Uh, uh, Duke and Cy and Art Tatum, of course. But is it true that at one point when you were 12 years old, someone billed you as the miniature king of swing? Oh, yes. Well, swing was the word back in those days. You well, how did swing get to you? When do you first remember hearing it? Where were you? Like, was it home, on the radio? Did you... 
go to clubs when you were a kid? I went to clubs when I was a kid. You're quite yeah. right. That was my reward for hard work, hard, hard nights work, you see. Mm -hmm. And you started playing when you were what? Four. Did you play any other instruments other than piano? Just the piano. Mm. I used to long for an accordion, but I grew to hate the accordion until I heard Art Mooney Listen, play. We can't, you can't go to Cafe Carlisle and see Bobby Short with an accordion there. Can moment. you imagine that? A polka group You can wear those background. nice big white satin sleeves, though. You know, they, they have those big <laughs> and tight black satin trousers. It doesn't trousers. work, Bobby. It's not going to happen. <laughs> Let's take some questions for, uh, from the audience. We have a good group here of jazz fans. I would assume we, how many are hardcore jazz fans in the audience today, right? That's what I thought. Okay. Here we have a combination audience member and photographer. What's your name? Okay, my name is Frank Fraticelli. I am, uh, first of all, I like to say that uh, I think the host deserves a great deal of credit. He's a fantastic host, Bill Bob. Me? Fantastic. Listen, I don't play the piano, man. And uh, <laughs> I'm, today, I'm the, lucky, I'm the luckiest guy in the world today to be able to sit down and listen to this firsthand and meet all these musicians. So I, I thank you for that. I want to thank Matt for helping put the show together. Marvelous. Fantastic, yeah. So far it's been fantastic. Uh, Mr. Short, I wanted to ask you a question. Uh, I seen your, for the first time that I ever saw you, I must say, has been on that commercial, uh, Charlie. Mm. And uh, I wanted to ask you, how were you selected for that show? Because of my being myself, I suppose. Yeah, well, yes. it's, it's been some commercial. I think it's done a great deal for Charlie. <laughs> well, I hope so. <laughs> what has it done for Bobby? That's what <laughs> I want to know. <laughs> Recognition, I guess, you know, I, I, it's the first time, I, again, it's the first time I've ever seen him. How do you feel about this response? Now, here, here you've cut out this enormously influential career. You're one of a kind, the greatest cab cabaret artist of your kind in the world. And here's a guy who's only seen you in a commercial. How do you relate to that? Well, I must ask if, if he's a voting age. If he is, I'll run for president. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> and somebody, I said, somebody said to me, you have to ask Bobby Short how he feels now that Mel Torme is doing the commercial. Well, we're doing it sort of in a split fashion, aren't we? He's doing it, and I'm doing it. It's okay, right? Yeah, it's totally all right. I love Mel Torme. Oh, know? he's he's yeah. nice. I saw him uh, with Jerry Mulligan a couple of months ago at Carnegie Hall. Ripped the place up. Another question. Yes. My name is Charles Parker, and I'm an upcoming musician. With a name like that, you can't miss <laughs> the world of really jazz. Yes. <laughs> And I would like to ask Mr. Short, how did he first get started in the business? Well, I began when I was a child, and I think the, the compulsion was to uh, express myself and to escape my surroundings. I'm from a very small town in the Midwest, and it sometimes rather lackluster around there. And I wanted to get out and see the big towns and meet the big people and hear some big music, and so I got out. Okay, thank you. How did you begin your relationship with the Carlisle? How long have you been there now? Oh, that's such an old... Uh, I don't know the answer to it. If I, figure, I, if I don't there, know the answer, I can ask the question. I went there in 1968, Bill, to uh, fill in for two weeks while the other uh, performing pianist was away on vacation. I had a very effective two weeks there, and so I was asked <laughs> to stay on. Two weeks. It was rather effective, I would say. So I was asked to stay on. I stayed on. Now you're going to be playing London. Where do you play when you go to London? We're going to play the Playboy Club for Victor Lowndes all London, of July. Okay. And then on for a little vacation. Oh, yes, yes. And uh, back to the Carlisle when? Mid-September. Is it tough when you're so used to playing sitting down? Occasionally, I've seen you standing up singing. Not too often. Well, I stand up more and more. I'll be standing up June 24th, as a matter of fact, with Dick Hyman's orchestra. Whole orchestra? Band? Which ain't bad. You know. No, I think that's terrific. Lots right, of violins. Let's take a break. Have you ever worked with Jerry Mulligan one-on-one? -on -one? Uh, not one-on-one, -on -one, but Jerry and I once shared a concert date years ago in our infancy in Southern California. All right, now here's what I'd like to do. I want to bring Jerry Mulligan up right here and have you play and Jerry Mulligan play, and we'll see it for the first time. Is that okay? I think it's sensational. I'm going to do it right after this. We'll be right back. Don't go away. <laughs> sound of Jerry Mulligan. Hi, Jerry. Hi. Nice to see you. Uh, Jerry Mulligan, I, I, I don't know how I could describe her sound except very mellow. Thank Makes you. me feel mighty good. And you're working in front of a tremendous, very young, powerful big band now. That's true. And touring around with the group? Yes. Yeah. We'll be playing with the big band at the uh, show in uh, Saratoga on July 1st. July 1st. And how about with the jazz festival? On the festival in the city, I'll be doing a, a show that uh, Mel Torme and I are co-producing. Uh, it's the, the salute to the American Songwriter Night. That'll be good. We do some of the stuff that I saw you do at Carnegie Hall with Torme a couple months no, back. No, Mel is going to do. Uh, let's see. I think he chose to do Jerome Kern mm -hmm. songs, 
and we're going to do a segment of uh, songs written by jazz musicians. Okay. For instance, uh, a lot of writers that uh, that were, were a lot of players who had one song that was really well known. You know, yeah. for instance, like uh, "What's New," a song of Bob Haggart's, the bass player, Misty, Errol Garner, and uh, we'll have Vic Dickinson and, and uh, as a trombone player is going to sing, and uh, Doc Cheatham also, a trumpet yeah. player. We're going to do the best we can with the. What's the jazz player song? When will that be again? That's the on festival? the uh, that's the 26th, I believe. 26th? No, and 29th. Oh, we're, we're clear it's one out. of when those. Mrs. Ween comes out. Go uh, ahead. A couple <laughs> things. You, when you were in sixth grade, you were playing the clarinet. Right. You started out on the piano. Why did you set, settle on this instrument? What? Nobody told me I couldn't. That was it? <laughs> More or less. I don't know. I, I, I started with the clarinet and sort of worked my... Then I went to the saxophone and worked my way down. And what about this specific instrument? Where did you get it? How old is it? And how come it has spots and stuff all over there? <laughs> Looks like you could use a little brasso on the outside. I wish you hadn't said that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get a new one. Uh, the new one I'm going to get is built about two years after this one. Really? So and when, when was this new. built? This is about uh, middle 20s, I guess, about 1925, 26. And who had it before you? Do you have any idea? Yes, this was uh, uh, in a hotel in Minneapolis, probably from the day it was born until the day I bought it. And it would just was passed from one band to another, you know, like one, as the bands changed. This was the doubling horn, so it never had to go out and face the world. Well, well the thing is, Jerry, what was there about this instrument? I mean, you've obviously been playing it for a long time. Why did, why did you settle on this instrument that had been living in a hotel? <laughs> well, I was lucky to get it. I had uh, another horn that was very similar to this. And uh, I was on a tour with uh, Duke Ellington's band, and m my quartet was appearing with uh, Duke's band. And uh, my horn fell apart one night on stage in Pittsburgh. And I played on Harry Carney's horn for, for a couple of nights. And he said, wait until we get to Minneapolis, because there's a good repairman in Minneapolis. So I did. And we went into the shop together. And there were two musicians from the hotel. And they said, oh, we have a horn just like that at the hotel. I said, good, I'll buy it. And that, so that was it. The outside, it doesn't make any difference. If, no, it's... I mean, uh, this, if you were in the Army, and that was your belt buckle, you'd be in trouble. I'd be in trouble. But I'd doesn't... be in trouble anyway if I was in the <laughs> yeah, Army. Me too. <laughs> All of us, I think. We, we're, not, we're not going that way. Hey, how about uh, the collaboration? Between the two of you, you had never really played together professionally before, correct? Right. Together? This is our debut. All right, so this is like a musical encounter of the first kind. Shall we encounter in Georgia? Hell, why not? <laughs> you have Georgia on your mind? I have Georgia on my we'll mind. We'll do it. <laughs>
works. You did it. Thank you. I like that section you were doing in there. It reminded me of a piece of Duke's. What was it? That's, that's, uh, that's uh, Brubeck's. Oh, they he, call the Duke. Yeah. Yeah, that's... The yeah. Duke, right? Such a nice I brew back, yes. Bobby Short is just not another pretty voice. <laughs> <laughs> he can play it. He really can. We got a couple people in the questions, uh, people in the audience with questions, right. I believe, for Jerry Mulligan. First up, man without an instrument in his hand. Yeah. Hi, I'm Louis Tucheron. I'd like to ask Jerry uh, how he could compare the state of jazz in 1979 as regards public acceptance and state of talent as, say, like 1949, like the birth of the cool, et cetera. All right, you got 30 seconds. I can do this in 30 seconds? Uh, take your time. That's a good question. Thank you. <laughs> well, the state of jazz uh, today as compared to 49, there are so many good players around today, and uh, uh, a lot of musicians have had the opportunity to, to go to, uh, to colleges and universities and uh, music schools that uh, are much more widespread than they were in those days. So I think for actual equipment, the actual uh, technical ability of, of the uh, musicians today, the younger musicians especially, is probably superior to the, uh, to the training that, that we were able to get in, in uh, earlier years. Uh, on the other hand, talent is talent, and there's always uh, plenty of that around. There sure was a lot of around in 49, and uh, I hope that uh, 79 is as lucky. Okay, next up with a question, please. Yes. Uh, my name's Arthur Randolph. I'd like to ask Mr. Mullen. Why is it that everyone in the audience says sounds like a musician? Their names and their voices sound like <laughs> Arthur Randolph, right? Yeah, I'm not a musician. All right, go ahead, Arthur. Uh, most young musicians coming up uh, have a, a positive uh, idol or someone that uh, had a positive influence on them. And I was wondering uh, if you had one and who it was when you were coming up. Oh, yeah, I had lots of idols. Duke Ellington was one. And Harry Carney and uh, uh, a lot of the men that played with the band were, were idols of mine. Plus Charlie Parker, Louis Armstrong, Art Tatum, uh, Jimmy Dorsey. Um, just there, there were so many models that, uh, and that, of course, that's the reason I got involved with music in the first place. It was just, uh, it was just a great cornucopia of marvelous possibilities. When you were 19 years old, you were working with Gene Krupa, right? right. Mm -hmm. Playing as well as writing with Gene Krupa. Yes. What kind of a, an influence was Gene Krupa on your young life at age 19? Well, he was, a, a very, was very lucky for me to, to play with his band because uh, Gene's interests in music were uh, very broad. He, he introduced me and a lot of the other members of the band.